All right. Last week, I told you that today I was going to share with you how to continue in the Word. Jesus makes the statement in John chapter 8 and verse number 31. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But now remember, it's not the truth that makes you free. It's your knowledge of the truth. Notice what he said. You shall what? Know the truth. And the truth that you know will make you free. But practically speaking, it's not just the truth that you know, but it is the truth that you know and can recall at the moment. Amen. You ever been taking an examination and you knew you knew the answer to that question, but you could not think of it until they had taken the papers up. <laughs> you cannot get credit for it. So you've got to know it and be able to recall it. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what would have happened when the devil tempted him if he could not have recalled the scripture? Amen. So it's not just what we know, but what we know and can recall at the moment. Now that's the way all of life functions. If you cannot recall the information, it cannot help you. You ever met a person and they told you their name and then you saw them again and you were trying to get their attention, but you could not remember their name. You couldn't remember their name until they had gone way on down the street too far away to hear it. So it's the truth that we know and can recall at the moment that makes us free. But now continuing in the word is how we come to know that truth. And then Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, if you continue in my word, then are you disciples of mine. Amen. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. So disciples continue in the word. Right. That's what disciples do. They continue in the word. Amen. Have you ever been trying to find a place and you missed your turn. Has that ever happened to you? You may have had a map in the days of maps. Or you may have been using your GPS but not paying attention. And you missed your turn. Whoever provided the directions, if it was a person or if it was GPS, they had provided directions, they had given you a route, and they wanted you to continue in that route. That's right. Now you know what happened? If you're going to continue in the route that's given, here's what you have to do. You have to verify at every street. Because if you have to verify, do I turn on this street or do I not? At every intersection, you have to verify. Now if your GPS is speaking, then it will tell you. If it's visual, it will tell you. But you have to verify, is this a street I turn on or not? So at every intersection, you have to verify whether or not I should turn or whether or not I should continue. Well now, how do we continue in the word? Jesus said, you are disciples of mine if you continue in the Word. Amen. Well, now, how do you do that? I'm so glad you've come. All right. So we can answer that question for you today. How do we continue in the Word? Now, listen to this. This is how we continue in the Word. We continue in the Word by consciously, say consciously, consciously. say consciously, consciously, by consciously combating every specific lie with a specific truth from the Word of God. Amen. Now, I know that's a long sentence. That's why I gave you a handout. All right. How do we continue in the Word? We must consciously, not haphazardly, combat every specific 
lie with a specific truth from the Word of God. Now, it is the same thing we do if we're traveling. Every street, we have to verify, do I turn or do I not? Because you say, oh, I don't turn there. And then you keep going and then you look at the map and find out, oh, I have missed my turn. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do if we're going to continue in the word? We must consciously combat each specific lie mm -hmm. with a specific truth from the word of God. Otherwise, the lie will lead us away from the word. Amen. Well, now, how does that work? I'm going to give you four examples, and then the lesson is going to be yours. Four examples. How do we do that? How do we consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth from the word of God? Well, first of all, when we hear something, we may not know that it is a lie. Right, right. So what we do is we take it and measure it by the word of God. Amen. Now, here is a challenge I want to give you. The next time a person tells you something that is supposed to be biblical truth, then simply ask them what biblical passages teach that. Amen. And if you don't have a biblical passage that teach that, then I'm unwilling to believe that. Amen. All right. We've got to do what? Consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth from the word of God. It is the same thing a defense attorney does in the court of law. The prosecutor say, I have a video of your client breaking in the building. The defense attorney comes along and say, that is not a video of my client. Look at that man. That man has a mold over his left eye. My client doesn't have a mold over his left eye. So what we've done, we have taken truth and combat the lie so we can convince the juror. So what we got to do is consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth from the word of God. Amen. There are a number of lies out there. There are a number of lies out there that are being promoted under the disguise of Christianity and religion. Unfortunately, there are many churches that either ignorantly or intentionally are promoting things that are untrue. Now, there are four examples I want to give you, all right? Lie number one. Lie number one. Lie number one is that God will overlook because everybody thinks this is the way it ought to be done and everybody is doing it this way that God will overlook my disobedience. You hear people say all the time, well, everybody's doing it. God's not going to send everybody to hell. You heard, you heard that? Okay. That's a lie. God will overlook my disobedience. All right. Now, here's the truth. Romans 14 and verse number 12. Here is what it says. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, what that means is God will not judge us in the judgment as a group. Right. He will judge us individually. Amen. Each one of us will give an account of him to God. Amen. All right. Now, here's another truth. Second Corinthians five and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done. Whether good or bad, Amen. God's going to reward you for the good. He's going to hold us accountable and punish us for that which is not good. So what do you do? You take a specific truth and you combat specific lies with specific truth. Well, now when you discover what the truth is, what do you then do? You believe the truth and honor it. Believe it and honor it. All right? Now, let's another lie. 
The lie is that everyone is saved, even those who have not obeyed the gospel. There are those who believe that. That everybody is saved, whether or not they have obeyed the gospel or not. We are just saved because God is so good, he is so kind, he is so gracious, and he just cannot stand to see anyone not be in heaven. You take that and measure it with the truth. Here is what the truth say. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Dealing out retribution to who? Those who do not know God. And to those who do not what? Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what the Bible says. That he's going to deal out retribution to those who do not know God. Now... We may look at those who do not know God and miss the assignment. It is our responsibility to make sure people know God. Amen. See, it's our responsibility to get the word of truth yeah. out so there are no folk who do not know God. Right. It is our responsibility to make sure that everybody in Anderson knows God. Amen. Well, how is that going to happen? We must find a way to present the word of God so they can hear it and come to know God. And then encourage them to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we continue in the word? When we get to that road and, and that lie says this, we look at the GPS and say, no, I don't turn on that road. We got to consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth from the Word of God. Amen. All right? Let's look at a third lie. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. You've heard that? I've heard that. Well, what does the Bible say? You consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth Amen. from the Word of God. That's right. Every religious group, yes. for all practical purposes, practice some kind of baptism. Mm -hmm. And many people are baptized and they don't have a clue why they have done it. That's right. Some have done it, didn't care. Uh -huh. And but what does the Bible say? Let's see what the truth says. All right, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Mm -hmm. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Okay. Now, if that was all we had in the Bible, that would be enough to derail that idea. Right. Baptism now saves you. And then what Peter does he explains what baptism is. It is not the removal of the dirt from the flesh. It's not a bath. But what is it? It is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now here is what baptism is. There is a dry side of baptism and there's a wet side. The dry side is when I come to believe that Jesus is the resurrected Savior and I realize that it is his death, his burial, and his resurrection that provides the power for my salvation. That's right. It is not my personal ability to live perfect, but it is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want to place my trust in that. Amen. It's an appeal. Yeah. And as the wet, the dry side is a heart allegiance to the resurrection of Jesus. And then the wet side is I surrender to being baptized. Amen. 
I surrender to being baptized. Now let me illustrate it this way because baptism is the believer's wedding ceremony. Amen. Baptism is the believer's wedding ceremony. You know, I meet people all the time who are dating and one of them want to get married. And they, they, they want to be married but they cannot get the other person to go through the wedding ceremony. Y'all right. didn't get that. <laughs> the woman wants to get married. The guy says, I'm going to marry you. But she can't get him to do what? Go through the wedding ceremony. Amen. Because if he goes through the wedding ceremony, guess what? He will be married. But guess what? Since he doesn't go through that ceremony, he's not married. He's not married. So if we don't go through the ceremony of baptism, we are not married to the Lord. Now here's my simple question. If, if a person declares they want to be married to you, but they won't go through the wedding ceremony. You know what that say? They don't want to be married to you. We're going, we're going. That's right. A person who will not go through the ceremony of baptism doesn't want to be married to the Lord. Amen. Just that simple. All right. So the truth is baptism saves. Watch the text a little further. Pay close attention to this verse, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now notice that. You are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now some folk have read and stopped reading right there. That's far as they read. Well explain that faith in depth. Look at the very next verse. For all of you who were baptized into Christ. Now my question is, how does the Bible say one gets into Christ? Okay, let me ask this question. How does the Bible say that one, not the Bible, but how does one get into marriage? He get into marriage through a wedding. There has to be a wedding of some type. Otherwise, what? You're not married. So you get into marriage by wedding. Yes. So you get into Christ. How? Being baptized. Amen. That's how we get into Christ. So a person who has not been baptized is not in Christ. Amen. Not in Christ. Right. Now remember, Peter said it's an appeal. So it has something to do with our understanding. So before that happens, we must understand what it is that we're doing. All right, so we take every lie, consciously combat it with a specific truth from the Word of God. Now, here's another lie, that the church is not essential to our salvation. We're entering a time when people say, give me Jesus, but don't give me no church. You hear folks say that? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. But that's like saying I'm alive, but I'm not breathing. Really. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Now, people who say that they are religious, they are just not religious toward God. Religious simply means ritual, wow. routines, God has always had people to respond to him in particular ways. God's always had people. When we pray, we are responding to God in a particular way. Remember one time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, do what? Teach us to pray. Yes, if God hadn't had a specific routine, Jesus would have just said, it don't matter. Just, just whatever you want to do is fine. Mm -hmm. He taught them to pray. Mm -hmm. So let's see this lie about the church is not essential to salvation. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 8. It's up on the board for you. Talking about Jesus. Here's the truth. He is the head of the body. Wow. Let's say that together. He, he is, is the head, head of the body. body. Say it again. 
He is the head of the body. Say it again. He is the head of the body. Watch the very next phrase. The what? The church. What is the body? The church. See, the body in the church is used interchangeably. When you read the New Testament, Paul's writing, the body and the church are interchangeable. So when the Bible says something about the body, that's also true about the church. You see? Why? Because they're interchangeable. He is the, so Christ is the head of the body. Christ is the head of the church. Now that's Colossians 1 and verse 18. Now watch this. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the what? Church. Who's the head of the church? Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And he himself, well, what is the church? The body. Now watch the last phrase. He himself being what? The savior of the body. Well, what's the church? The body. What's the body? The church. So what he is the savior of? The church. Now that's plain and simple. That's been in your Bible all your life. Christ is the savior of the body. Now think about in the days of Noah. When there was an ark, God saved the ark. And the only people who were saved were in the ark. That's not hard to understand. Anybody in here ever been on a plane, on a flight? Listen, the only people who got to the destination were the folk who got on the plane. I mean, you can walk around an airport and wish to get there, but if you were not on the plane, guess what? You didn't get to the destination. Because the pilot is going to take the plane. He's not taking the cafeteria to New York. He's not taking the restroom to New York. He is taking the plane. And guess what? If you're going to get to New York with them, You've got to be where? On the plane. Now somebody said, man, a plane don't take nobody nowhere. Really? He is the savior of the body. God has always been a God of place. When he created Adam and Eve, where did he put them? In the garden of Eve. He didn't leave them to just wander around everywhere. God is a God of place. God had the tabernacle built. He's a God of place. Later, they built the temple. God is a God of place. Even when Jesus was raised from the dead, he told Mary, tell my disciples to meet me in Jerusalem. He's a God of place. And when the Lord returns, he's going to come and he's going to be a savior of those who are in his body the church. And then Ephesians 4 and verse 4 says, there is what? One body. Well, what's the body? The church. There's all kinds of things being said, but we, in order for us to continue in the word, we must consciously combat each specific lie with a specific truth from the word of God. And not only should we do that in regard to the Lord, you ought to do that in regard to everything in your life. When people tell you something, you ought to verify it. Do you know people report things and say things and then people go off and tell it to other folk and they have never verified whether or not it is true. Amen. And then untruth circulating all over the county because people did not verify that it was true. If we're going to be people of God, we need to only report that which is true. Amen. Don't just say what somebody says. That's right. Just if you haven't had a chance to verify it, don't report it as true. Do you know there are people in prison right today because someone said, and someone said, yeah, they said it, and, and they lied, and folk are in prison right today. There are people whose reputation have been destroyed. There are people whose lives have been snuffed out because people did not tell the truth. Amen. Truth is so important. And God wants us to continue 
in His Word, and that's how we get the truth. When something is said, we want to ask the question, where is it taught in the Word of God? Amen. And then when we find it, we continue in it. And if we continue in the Word, we will be disciples of mine. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Did any of the truths that we mentioned today, does any of those affect you? Have you believed any of those things that we mentioned that are not true and have patterned your life according to them? If so, then it's never too late to change. See, here is what God does. See, it's, it's never too late for one to start following Jesus. That's right. So if he has kept you alive to this day, we need to make a commitment to truth. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Savior? Yes. Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess him to be Lord? Will you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sin? It is clear the Bible teaches that baptism has something to do with salvation. Because baptism puts us into Christ. And prior to being baptized, we must understand that we are being baptized in response to the resurrection of Jesus. So we must be taught something before we are baptized. That's why babies are not candidates for baptism. Their mentality is not at the point that they can be taught and understood. Before one can be baptized, they must respond at heart to the resurrection of Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to stand up and sing hymn number 195. Do you need to respond to the resurrection of Jesus and be baptized? Have you delayed it? Have you put it off long enough? Today is your day. Today is your day of salvation. We are singing the song, He Will Come and Save. 195, let us be standing and